Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been really nice to see uh, a lot of familiar names in there. So why blockchain for CBDC? So in many ways, CBDC has become synonymous with blockchain. However, CBDC could easily be implemented without it. Just look at China's DCEP, which uses a central state-owned database instead of a distributed ledger. So the question of why blockchain for CBDCs as a, as a preferred or even valid solution remains. So as many of us know, blockchain provides the ability to create a fully decentralized CBDC network. Entities other than the central bank can participate in the operation of the network, increasing resilience, security, efficiency, programmability, and interoperability. And compared to traditional financial networks, blockchains enable high-speed, low-cost transactions. I want to start with some basic blockchain functionality that is well aligned with the needs for a CBDC, and that is digital token properties. As we support, as, as we support ERC-20 tokens on OMG Network, I'll reference that standard in particular. First, ERC-20 tokens can be issued on any Ethereum-based platform, including Hyperledger Bezu. Token issuance on multiple platforms is also supported, enabling future cross-chain use. Second, tokens are controlled by the owner of the issuing smart contract, allowing, them, allowing for them to manage supply by minting and burning tokens, as well as potentially maintaining a list of restricted wallets. Third, tokens cannot be counterfeited uh, as they're irreplicable. Tokens issued from any other contract apart from the one owned by the central bank will not be accepted as valid. And, those are many, and, those are, uh, and there are many ways to secure the private keys controlling those functions. And the ERC-20 standard in particular has a whole ecosystem to support it, allowing for programmability, security, and interoperability. Now, the blockchain ecosystem has grown exponentially over the past few years with mature and innovative tools, products, and services. The decentralized finance or DeFi boom has created lending platforms, decentralized exchanges, and other financial services with increased accessibility and efficiency. The ecosystem also provides a set of best practices that have been tested against a very advanced adversarial environment. As Erica will present later, our CB CBDC lifecycle uses a variety of those best practices. This includes leveraging hot, warm, and cold wallets to ensure funds are safely held while still accessible for immediate needs. It includes key management techniques for, techniques for custodial wallets to ensure those managing wallets can keep, keep them secure and includes liquidity, settlement, and exchange services that help funds flow between traditional and digital channels. All this innovation can, be, can quickly be leveraged by C, CBDCs in adopting blockchain technology. And for those fear, fearful of the riskier DeFi schemes out there, the added support and oversight of a central bank reduces the risk for, the risk for mass adoption of these new financial services. Almost all C CBDC's designs are aiming for a cash-like asset with direct claims on the central bank. Blockchain technology is uniquely suited for these cash-like properties with a direct path to true and direct public ownership of the currency. For me, the most exciting possibility for CBDC is an open, on an open platform is the idea of public ownership. The public can actively participate in the operation of the CBDC network, becoming a true public good. The network will continue to operate uninterrupted for as long as the public is willing. Openness also paves the way for numerous possibilities for interoperability, especially at the supranational level. At the individual level, traditional digital money systems are custodial, with trusted central parties holding their funds. Blockchain technology gives us the option of true cash-like bearer ownership. In its purest form, wallets holding cryptographic keys have sole control over their funds. Wallets can still be custodial for those who don't want that responsibility. This gives people greater choice in how they want to manage their funds. Now, at their best, blockchains are trustless networks. Sometimes this can also be seen as trust minimized or distributed trust networks. But for the sake of this conversation, I'll refer to this characteristic as trustlessness. Actions of the, part of the participants in a trustless network are governed by protocols, crypto economics, and consensus mechanisms, rather than by trusted centralized parties. This trustlessness is the fundamental invention of blockchains that makes them unique. Never before have we been able to create such large trustless financial networks. By reducing the need for trust, we can also reduce much of the legal overhead to enforce that trust. We reduce the need for contracts and agreements and arrangements of liability. Again, this is most interesting at the supranational level. CBDCs are necessarily global. As large economies develop their own CBDC networks, smaller economies are at risk of being supplanted by these networks. This opens up issues of sovereignty and national security. 
regional and consortium networks are going to become more important. Trustless networks are better aligned to those sovereignty issues since these networks are truly peer-to-peer. -peer. Achieving regional or consortium CBDC interoperability through trustless networks can be more efficient by reducing the need for multilateral agreements. Central banks in a particular region or economic cooperative can agree, can agree on and trust consensus mechanisms instead of agreements, treaties, other traditional forms of interacting.